So I think George Washington was right to turn down the prospect of becoming King of America, because most of human history tells us that most kings suck. What follows are my initial thoughts and reactions to this book of the Bible. I have not done any outside research regarding the more challenging or problematic passages of Christian scripture, therefore do not take whatever criticisms I may make in this video as my final word on the passage or verse in question. I am very likely going to be doing a Bible Revisited series addressing my different issues with the Bible book by book after conducting ample outside research. So now, without further ado, let's jump into the review. So 2 Kings uh, is basically a continuation of 1 Kings, and uh, I actually believe that uh, the two books were at one time just one book. I don't exactly know why they were split into two, but uh, basically, yeah, 2 Kings is documenting all the different kings of Judah and, and uh, Israel and, uh, you know, just kings throughout the uh, Judeo-Christian history. And the book is rife with crazy kings, and populated with just a couple good kings. Um, I thought this book was amazing and a really good lesson on human nature. We, when we have absolute power, um, we turn into filthy animals. Like, it's the amount of times in 2 Kings and in 1 Kings when it just says, so-and-so did evil in the eyes of the Lord and, you know, started doing all the things that kings just shouldn't do. Like, the amount of times that happens, it's, I mean, it's, it's the majority of the book. Um, the majority of the book is populated by immoral actors who had absolute authority over people. And just the old saying, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely, very, 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 very true. Uh, in Second Kings, and I, I don't know, just the whole book, I really, I really loved it. There are a couple things here and there that I was a little um, iffy about or a little, you know, kind of uh, unsure about how I feel uh, regarding them, but for the most part, Second Kings was a terrific book that has a couple, like, incredible characters and then some just awful human beings also. But some of my favorite characters were obviously Elijah's in it, Elisha's in it, King Hezekiah, uh, King, I think is Josiah. Um, those characters were awesome, amazing. Uh, there were a couple other characters that were pretty, pretty cool as well. But uh, then there's like a giant, giant list of just evil kings. And they were interesting to read about too. Um, because one day when I become king, <laughs> but anyways, ladies and gentlemen, those are my like my initial like thoughts, my reactions, my feeling about the book of Second Kings. Now I would like to jump into the review and analysis of the different passages and verses in Second Kings that I thought were compelling, fascinating, um, applicable to our lives, and also some passages and verses that I thought were you know uh, a little maybe problematic or concerning. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into it. The first passage I would like to discuss is 2 Kings uh, chapter 1, verse 9 through um, <clears throat> 17. And this passage has to do with Elijah. Fascinating character, and what he does here in this passage is really, I don't know how else to describe it, but badass. To set the stage, um, this uh, the king, um, King Ahaziah, had uh, fallen through his upper room and he had injured himself and he was like, am I gonna die? Am I gonna? And basically Elijah's like, you're gonna die because you are sinful and uh, God doesn't like you. Uh, so yeah, you're, die you're gonna die, bro. And so King Ahaziah sends some people to find Elijah and basically uh, <laughs> retrieve him and take him to the king. And this is what Elijah does when the, the first party of soldiers show up and the subsequent parties of soldiers show up. 
Then he sent to Elijah a captain with his company of fifty men. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. At this the king sent to Elijah another captain and his, with his fifty men. The captain said to him, Man of God, this is what the king says, come down at once. If I am a man of God, Elijah replied, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. So the king sent a third captain with his fifty men. This third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these fifty men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went down with him to the king. He told the king, This is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel for you to consult that you have sent messengers to consult Baal Zebub, the god of Ikron? Because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So he died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Elijah basically broke the news in the most terrifying way by first eliminating two, I guess, arrogant captains and their soldiers. And then the, uh, the one good uh, captain, the third captain, uh, Elijah respected because it was clear that that captain respected God. Um, but even so, he still had to break the news that, hey, King Isaiah, you're done. Now I'd like to just discuss the entirety of chapter 2 of 2 Kings, which is basically where uh, Elijah is taken up to heaven. Elijah is such a mythical or, or mystical character in the Bible. He has so much, he performs all kinds of crazy miracles. He, he influences so many uh, different characters uh, throughout his storyline. And he doesn't die. He's one of the few, you know, characters in the book of the Bible who really doesn't die. I mean, Jesus even dies, but Elijah doesn't. Elijah is taken up to heaven in a whirlwind with chariots of fire and all this stuff, and it's amazing and beautiful and crazy. Also, I had never even heard of Elisha, or Elisha, who uh, was basically Elijah's, like, I don't know if you would call him disciple or best friend, but I think, yeah, I think you could call him Elijah's disciple. Um, Elisha inherits many of the same powers that Elijah had. As soon as Elijah disappears, Elisha becomes just as much of a miracle worker as Elijah, if not more so. The only passage in chapter 2 that I thought was like, kind of like weird and kind of troubling is, um, you know, like I said, Eli Eli Elisha or Elisha is, um, you know, he, he's a miracle worker and he can do things with the power of God. So whenever he does this one thing in uh, verses 23 to 25, I, I'm, God must have given him, him that power and thought that what he did was good, but I don't see how this is good. Uh, I'm just going to read the passage because it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's quite problematic, I think. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came out of the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. Go on up, you bald head. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. And he went up to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. Sure, these kids weren't doing a good thing, you know, calling names, teasing and stuff. I don't know if that justifies two bears slaughtering them in the name of God. If you know how that's justified, let me know in the comment section below. The next passage I would like to discuss uh, still has to do with Elisha. Uh, this is uh, verses 8 to 37 of chapter 4. Uh, Elisha, some of the miracles that he commits are uh, very, very um, similar to some of the miracles that Jesus performed. I mean, Elisha resurrects a, a child, and it's a very powerful story regarding the, the Shunammite woman, and um, I don't know, like, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but 
I found it really kind of like strikingly similar, obviously not the same as the story of Jesus resurrecting people in the Gospels, but um, the fact that Elisha had that power, obviously it wasn't inherently his power, it was God's power, but the fact that he exercised that power, um, I don't know, it's, he, Elisha's almost like, he's like a, kind of like a Christ-like figure. And this this idea, I think, is even made more apparent when you read verse 42 to um, 44 of the same chapter when Elisha feeds a hundred people. I'll just read that passage real quick. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his, serv his servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. Now that's like a very, very short uh, story, but remember when Jesus fed, uh, yeah, he fed the 500, I believe. Um, it was also like there was there was leftover food, and he it was like he multiplied enough food for people, everyone to be able to eat. It's just really fascinating the similarities between Elisha and Jesus, they are um, uncanny. Now the next passage I would like to discuss is chapter six, verses one to seven. This passage, I'm just gonna read it because it's so cool. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole. Let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, go. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh my lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. That's like That's just like a really small little miracle. It's not, you know... I was talking just a second ago about Elisha and Jesus being comparable. Um, this is, I guess, this is a very unique miracle. I don't remember anything about an axe head in the New Testament, but whoa, he made an iron axe head float. That's like one of those like small miracles that at the same time is like hugely interesting. Now, immediately following that passage in chapter six, verses eight to uh, 23, this whole thing regarding Elisha trapping blinded Arameans, that whole miracle is like insane. And it also like it illustrates the whole uh, idea of turning the other cheek kind of, and also instilling the fear of God in people. There's a whole bunch of Arameans that are coming to like kill everybody. And Elisha bl asks God to blind them and send them someplace else. And they are blinded and go someplace else and they're surrounded and everything. and you know, Israel could destroy them. And yet Elisha is just like, no, we're not going to kill them. We're just going to feed them and we're going to send them on their way. And like, can you imagine like that? Those Arameans must have been so freaking terrified. The fact that they had been blinded. And then instead of getting slaughtered, Elisha's just like, no, you're free to go. But just know what we can do to you. Me and God, the man upstairs. Now the next passage I would love to discuss is chapter six of Second Kings, uh, verses 24 to 31. This passage, the reason I bring it up is it actually fulfills a prophecy from much earlier in the uh, Old Testament, I believe in Deuteronomy, about basically people having to eat their children because of God's punishment against them. Uh, this fulfills that, and it's quite terrifying. I'm gonna read the passage, and I'd also write, like to read the uh, explanation in my Life Application Bible, because I think it is, um, I think it's worthwhile. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seeds, seed pods, for five shekels. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord the king. The king replied, If the lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press? Then he asked her, What's the matter? 
She answered, This woman said to me, Give up your son so we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, Give up your son so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. He said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Now, Elisha did not cause any of this. This was just basically Ben-Hadad uh, blaming Elisha for things. Um, but, yeah, crazy passage. Now let me read uh, the life application. Application. When a city like Samaria faced famine, it was no small matter. Although its farmers grew enough food to feed the people for a specific season, they did not have enough to maintain them in prolonged times of emergency when all supplies were cut off. This famine was so severe that mothers resorted to eating their children. Deuteronomy chapter 28, 49 to 57 predicted this, that this would happen when the people of Israel rejected God's leadership. Yeah, I remember that was one of the most haunting passages from earlier in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. I remember I was like, whoa, this is metal. And it came to fruition. Now the next passage I would like to discuss and analyze is 2 Kings chapter 9 verses 30 to 37. Now this passage, uh, I'm not going to read it, but it has to do with Jezebel and the fact that you know she was kind of a wicked woman and uh, Elisha had predicted that she was going, when she is killed, not anything would be left of her except for maybe like a, like a skull. And um, yeah, that's what happens because dogs eat the rest of her. I just, it's a crazy passage. I, I couldn't just overlook it, but it's basically like, don't be a Jezebel because you might get eaten by your dog sparkles. Now let's talk about chapter 10 of 2 Kings, and this is more specifically talking about chapter 10 verses 9 through 11, where basically Jehu is in the process of killing all of Ahab's family and friends and acquaintances. Um, and he goes way overboard with what God had commanded him to do. And I think this passage is a great illustration of what it actually means to take God's name in vain. Um, like, I know a lot of people freak out over, oh my god, what? You know, where you used to say, oh my god, and I don't, I tend to say, oh my gosh, but, um, I don't know if saying, oh my god, is actually saying God's name in vain. It's using it cheaply, I agree, but it's, it's not like what Jehu does here. This is what I really think taking God's name in vain is. Now, this is verse 9, and this is after Jehu had had, uh, he'd had 70, uh, royal princes associated with King Ahab uh, slaughtered and beheaded and put their heads put into baskets. And this is what he says after all that has been done. The next morning, Jehu went out. He stood before all the people and said, You are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? You know, the heads. Uh, know then that not a word the Lord has spoken against the house of Ahab will fail. The Lord has done what he promised through his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed everyone in Jezreel who remained of the house of Ahab, as well as all their, his chief men, his close friends, and his priests, lead, leaving him no survivor. Now, this next thing I'm going to read is uh, from my Life Application Bible, and I think it is pertinent information to the discussion. In his zeal, Jehu went far beyond the Lord's command with this bloodbath. The prophet Hosea later announced punishment upon Jehu's dynasty for his senseless slaughter. Many times in history, religious people have mixed faith with personal ambition, power, or cruelty without God's consent or blessing. To use God or the Bible to condone oppression is wrong. When people attack Christianity because of the atrocities that Christians carried out, help them to see that these men and women were using faith to their own political ends and not following Christ. In many cases, I do believe, yeah, that is the case for many atrocities. But there are some things in the Bible where I'm like, well, it seems like God did want people to commit atrocities with his name. But in this case, it seems clear that Jehu uh, is basically taking the Lord's name in vain and saying, God commanded me to completely wipe out everyone who even knew this guy Ahab. And so he went overboard and... Uh, yeah, disobeyed God by doing that. Now we come back to discussing Elisha, because the guy is just too interesting, and this thing that I'm about to read is too interesting to just 
gloss over, okay? This is chapter 13, verses 14 to 21. This passage is like one of those that makes you go, whoa? So I'm just gonna read it. And if you want to also go, whoa, please do. Now Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows, and he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Elisha died and was buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. What is with this guy, Elisha? He's like, like, holy crap. He's just resurrecting people left and right, even after he's dead, just by touching his body. Like it's, like I said, there's some, there's some similarities between him and Jesus. Like, uh, there's obviously the story where the woman tries to just touch Jesus' cloak in order to be healed, and she's healed. In this case, a dead guy didn't even mean to touch Elisha's body, but he did touch Elisha's body and was resurrected. Like, whoa! Now we come to chapter 14 of 2 Kings, and uh, this passage we're going to talk about is uh, 1 to uh, verse 6. Um, I have a problem with the Old Testament regarding punishment of sons for the sins of their fathers. It's said in the Bible that that is a sin to punish a son for the sin of the father. Everybody should be judged according to their own deeds. And yet it seems like over and over and over again, God punishes sons for the sins of their fathers, he himself. But here, King Amaziah, he does the right thing according to the law, but it confuses me because now I'm wondering, well, is who's right here? Is this guy right or is God right? It's, it's confusing. I'm just going to read the passage and we'll continue the discussion. In the second year of Jehoash, son of Jehoazath, whatever, king of Israel, Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoiadan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father David had done. In everything, he followed the example of his father Joash. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. <laughs> Just gotta say, people, all these, almost all of these kings, they don't remove the high places. They still allow the pagan worship and everything. It's like, just people never learn. Anyways, moving on. Uh, verse five. After the kingdom was firmly in his grasp, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. Yet he did not put the sons of the assassins to death. And in accordance with what was written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded, fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers, each is to die for his own sins. See, I totally agree with that, with that law, but my issue with the Old Testament, as you'll see in many of my other uh, reviews of the books, uh, it seems like God himself punish his sons for the sins of their fathers. And I don't know how that's justified. It seems like a contradic a moral contradiction for God. And if it really is a contradiction, then that means that God is not perfect. If anyone can explain how uh, it's not a contradiction, please let me know. But good on King Amaziah for not punishing sons for the sins of their fathers. Now we come to one of my other favorite characters in the book of 2 Kings, King Hezekiah. Uh, pretty much chapters 18 through 20 cover his, his reign and what he did. And it's pretty amazing. Basically, King Sennacherib of Assyria is saying to King Hezekiah like, hey, why do you think that your God's gonna save you? My kingdom has destroyed every other kingdom. You're done. Stop giving your people hope, okay? There is no hope with me around. Submit. Give in. 
don't try and don't try and give false hope or lie to your people because your God's not real. Or if he is real, he's on my side. And Hezekiah is really, he's one of the few kings that's like really, truly like quite great. He, he's one of the few kings, like this is verse uh, four of chapter 18. He's one of the few kings that did this. He said, it says, he removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan or whatever. He's one of the few that actually was like, you know what? No, we're going to destroy this, these evil places. We're not going to just let them hang out in the background. He's very frightened and terrified of uh, Sennacherib and the Assyrians because it's like, yeah, they have a track record of, a record of destroying kingdoms. And what makes his kingdom any different? What does make his kingdom different is Hezekiah's devotion to God. Uh, there's a prayer I would like to read that I think is really powerful. And uh, he, he just goes and he just goes to God humbly and without pride or arrogance. And it's really beautiful and admirable. I would hope to be this way in a time of stress and tribulation. Like I said, we're covering uh, chapters 18 to 20, but this is in chapter 19 and this is verse 14 to 19. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Now this is basically a letter that's about all the horrible things the Assyrians are gonna do to them and how God isn't on your side. Basically those sentiments that I just expressed a moment ago. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by men's hands. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. It's just basically Hezekiah, you know, just pleading for help. And God sees his heart and he rewards him Isaiah the prophet, who later has a book in uh, the Old Testament, uh, prophesies then basically the demise of the Assyrians and the ascension of Jerusalem. And it's pretty amazing. I'm not going to read that part of uh, the 18 through 20. The reason the Assyrians in the first place had been conquering everyone was because God was, a, was basically, in a way he was on their side, but he was on their side only as a, as a punishment of the sinful Israelites. But now the Assyrians were arrogant, the king arrogant, thought it was all his power that was allowing him to do these things. But nope, God's like, nah, bro, uh, it's not you, it's me. And uh, since you think it was you, you're done. That is why in verse 35 of chapter 19, to, to the end of chapter 19, this is what is written. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, they were all there were all the dead bodies. So Snatcherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adremelech and Sherezer cut him down with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Eratat. And Esarhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. To uh, King Sennacherib, basically, God was like, what goes around, comes around. Now, skipping ahead to chapter 22 of 2 Kings, we are talking about King Josiah. Now, I really like King Josiah. I just want to read the opening uh, two verses of, uh, you know, his reign, because they're pretty epic, and I think there are some lessons to be learned uh, from just these two verses regarding politics, oddly enough. So I'm just going to read verse 1 and 2. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. First of all, what an eight-year-old. Like, seriously. Whoa. Impressive. I'm a fan. But the other part of this short little passage I really want to discuss is it says, you know, in verse 2, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. 
not turning aside to the right or to the left. Now here, they're not really talking about politics, but obviously in America, there's the right and there's the left. And what Josiah did, you know, he's a king, technically you could call him a politician. Um, he sought only to serve God and he didn't do what politicians in our society do, which is turn to the right or to the left, turn to partisan interests. He looked to what was right uh, in heaven, not on earth. He didn't, he, like if, if Josiah was king today somewhere or a political leader today, I think you could say that he wouldn't, he wouldn't, you, you might even say he's, a, he's an independent. He, he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, be super partisan. He wouldn't make decisions based on party lines. He would make decisions on what is right uh, according to God. And I think there's a lesson that we can take from that uh, in our time today, a lesson that all politicians should take. Um, you know, just don't do what is right because it's right, not because it's politically expedient or beneficial to you, uh, and not because it's just what your party believes. Now, I'm just going to discuss uh, the rest of chapter 22 and chapter 23. Um, basically, what's so fascinating about Josiah is, you know, it's almost like during his time, and for decades upon decades, perhaps even centuries, um, the Book of the Law, the Old Testament, that Moses' law had been forgotten, uh, basically lost. And so when Josiah was looking to God and everything that he did, he didn't actually have a roadmap to go off of. But what happens in chapter 22 is the Book of the Law, probably, it's probably, probably the entire book of Deuteronomy or one of the uh, earlier books of the Old Testament regarding the law, um, that is found in the Temple of the Lord. It's discovered. Um, and Josiah reads it and realizes that his kingdom, just everything is totally out of whack. It's not in accordance with God's will. And what Josiah does is pretty shocking. He um, decides, like, hey, he, I mean, he, he makes the bold move of what I was just talking about a second ago, of doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord and no one else. Uh, he basically destroys everything in his society that is unlawful. So all the pagan shrines, the, 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 the witches and the spiritists and all of these people and the practices, he destroys them, forbids them, he tears down everything that's ungodly. He has one of those qualities in a leader that's very admirable, which is he had a backbone. Or to put it more crudely, Josiah had balls uh, to do the right thing. So that concludes my discussion regarding the good kings and uh, kind of spiritual leaders in 2 Kings. And unfortunately, um, the bad kings kind of win. I mean, they lose in the end, but like they win uh, right after King Josiah, the subsequent kings of Israel and Judah um, turn back to their evil ways. And the final punishment that God had been talking about for a very long time where basically the Jews get just just annihilated comes with King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Babylon. And um, in chapters 24 and 25, it's really just a haunting description of the Israelites' whole way of life being completely destroyed, erased, um, and... Fear being the number one thing on everyone's mind. And uh, it's it's a crazy, crazy book, Second Kings. One of the things that's so striking about the Bible is it is accurate to human nature. Most books aren't. Some people are like, oh, people are naturally good, you know? Yeah, there, people are just overall, on average, people are good. The Bible's like, no. On average, people are horrible. It's in their nature to be horrible. I think this is correct, by the way, um, and Second Kings backs up that view. And I'd like to close this review and analysis with uh, the last uh, note, footnote, in my Life Application Bible regarding Second Kings, and I think it really summarizes what Second Kings is all about, and it's very powerful. The book of Second Kings opens with Elijah being carried to heaven, the destination awaiting those who follow God. But the book ends with the people of Judah being carried off to foreign lands as humiliated slaves, the result of failing to follow God. Second Kings is an illustration of what happens when we make anything more important than God. 
when we make ruinous alliances, when our consciences become desensitized to right and wrong, and when, we, and when we are no longer able to discern God's purpose for our lives. We may fail like the people of Judah and Israel, but God's promises do not. He is always there to help us straighten out our lives and start over. And that is just what would happen in the book of Ezra. When the people acknowledge their sins, God was ready and willing to help them return to their land and start again. So anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that is my review and analysis of the book of 2 Kings. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something from this video. Um, and I hope that uh, when you read the book of 2 Kings, you uh, find answers to some of the questions that uh, I asked in this video. And uh, if you have any explanations or anything, any comments or even just funny things you want to write in the comment section below, uh, please write all those things in the comment section below. I want to hear what you have to say. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, if you like this video, please like it and subscribe. Tell your friends about the channel. And never forget to...